So this morning we are concluding a series that we've done on finding God in the stories that we tell our children. Each week we've looked at a particular children's storybook to help us as grown-ups be able to understand a little bit more about the nature and character of God and also to help us think about how to share who God is with our children and with our grandchildren. So the first week, we introduced or reintroduced to you a story that's been around for quite some time, but many of you didn't know, called The Runaway Bunny. And in that, we focused on the characteristic of God um, who is constantly seeking and searching for us. The second week, I read the story of Mama, Do You Love Me?, And we talked about God's faithfulness and God's forgiveness, as well as the challenge that as receiving that, we are expected to give that to others as well. And then last week, Steve looked at a well-loved book, The Giving Tree, who gives away everything. And we talked about God's goodness and generosity and acknowledging how difficult it is sometimes to be able to hold and bear that kind of sacrificial love. Now this week, we're gonna talk about the characteristics of God as um, purposeful and powerful. And we'll look at that intention with how we handle that when things don't go so well, when there is suffering, when there is challenge, when there's difficulty. So as we begin, I invite you to bow your heads and pray for me this morning and sharing this message with you as I'll pray for you in receiving it. Let's pray. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So this morning we get to meet Alexander. Now, this book about Alexander has been around for 45 years this year. And some of you may be a little bit more familiar with it because it was more recently made into a movie, which is loosely based on the book as well. Um, The book says the author in the preface, she talks about the book and says, bad days make us so mad and so sad that sometimes we want to move to where terrible, horrible days maybe don't happen. So I invite you now to follow along with me as I read Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day by Judith Viorst. So how many of you have ever had a day that felt like that? Or perhaps how many of you yesterday during the second half of the football game thought that you were having a day like that? And sometimes, you know, it's not just a day. Sometimes it's a week or a month or even a year. It was 20 years ago this summer that began what I would say was a terrible, horrible time in our lives. We were appointed to move to a new place and to do a new church start. And two months after that, our son, Sid, was born. And he was born with a significant health issue that meant he was in the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit, for 10 weeks. And he had home health care eight hours a day, seven days a week for seven months. And he had a gastrostomy, and we had to feed him out of the tube for two years. And he had surgeries, and it began a series of surgeries. That same time, my parents basically moved in with us to help us care for each other and to care for our four-year-old daughter. And 
While they were down at our house, my father's jaw broke when he was eating a sandwich, and then he had an infection in the bone, and he had to be on a pick line, and he had to have surgeries. And then finally, my mother, that same year, ended up having bilateral knee replacement. It was just not a good time in the Price Fluck clan. It was a time that truly felt to all of us like a no good, horrible, very bad time. You know, in the book, Alexander seems to think that if he could just move to Australia, he would have no more no good days. You know, that kind of reminds me of us sometimes. I think the same thing sometimes is true of us when, if we're honest, deep down inside, we kind of think, well, because I'm a follower of Christ, because I believe in God, then bad things shouldn't happen to me, or at least not the very worst things. And if it does, then we sometimes begin to make these statements to make sense of it all. And those statements have the underlying belief that God is the one who causes these bad things to happen. You know, how many times have you said or heard someone say with regard to suffering, this must be God's will, or God must have a reason for this, or this must be a part of God's plan? I believe that God does have a plan, but not that kind of plan. So let's listen to the plan that we hear about in Scripture. I'll read this morning from the first chapter of, Paul, uh, of the letter to the Ephesians, and I invite you to follow along with me on the screen. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved in Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. This is the word of God for the people of God, and God's people say, thanks be to God. So our scripture does say that God has a plan. God's plan for us is that God chose to love us even before the foundation of the world. God's plan for us is that God destined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ. God's plan is to lavish grace on us and in the fullness of time to bring all things together in Jesus Christ. Now that is typically not what people say when they mean that God has a plan, mean when they say that God has a plan. When people say God has a plan, it often implies that God has a plan for absolutely everything, both good and bad, both joy and suffering, and that God causes all of those things to happen, both good and bad, both joy and suffering. <laughs> 
God has a plan. That kind of understanding that God causes everything to happen is what is called religious or theological determinism. That's the belief that, that God is the micromanager of everything in our world. That God is controlling every single action and event in our world, both big and small, and orchestrating what happens in every moment. This understanding or the foundation of that understanding was the belief of John Calvin, a lawyer turned pastor in the 16th century, who asserted that everything was determined by God beforehand, including who would receive salvation and who would not. Calvin believed that God knew beforehand and therefore predetermined who would be saved and who would not. And therefore, there were a limited number of people who, who were predestined to be followers of Christ. And likewise, those who were predestined to not be followers of Christ. This kind of determinism also led people to believe that God is then responsible for things like birth defects and cancer and hurricanes. The opposite of that kind of thinking, this theological or religious determinism, is called deism. Deism is the belief that gained prominence during the Enlightenment and was popular with the founding fathers of our nations, of our nation. <clears throat> Deism is the belief that God is the creator of the universe, but as soon as it was created, God stepped back and just became um, a watchmaker. God put everything to work by, by natural laws and then sat back to let it go. In today's terms, we might call deism or the image of God portrayed in deism as an absentee landlord. There are problems with both of those kinds of understandings of God. First of all, determination, determinism takes away our responsibility, takes away our free will. And we all know that we have the free will to make choices. Sometimes there are sins of omission, like when Alexander in the storybook said that he drew an invisible castle. Today, a sin of omission might be when good people stand by and do nothing. Sometimes there are sins of commission, in our book, Alexander chose to punch his brother and was scolded by his mother. Some choose to spew hatred at people who are different than they are. Some choose um, self-destructive behavior that brings harm to themselves and to others. Both action and non-action can have serious consequences. We all have free will. We all have the choice and can choose life and what is good or we can choose what is bad that leads to death. Secondly, determinism makes God responsible for everything that happens in our world, even the horrible tragedies of our world. But sometimes things simply happen. Sometimes it's random luck, like when Anthony found the Corvette Stingray car kit in his breakfast cereal box and Nick found the junior undercover agent code ring in his cereal box, but Alexander found nothing. Sometimes it's random luck. Often there seems to be no rhyme or reason why injury or illness occurs. Alexander gets a cavity. A child is born with a significant health issue. A person gets cancer. And then some things are just acts of nature. Both mud puddles, like the one that Alexander slipped in, and devastating hurricanes can be, cur be caused by nature and um, by weather patterns. 
Some people say that because God is purposeful and has a plan, that God causes everything, including the terrible, horrible things to happen. But remember, God's plan is for our good. God's plan is to lavish grace on us. God's plan is for our adoption as children of God. In one of the churches that I served, there was a young couple, and we got to know them, and um, over time, they shared with me that um, during a worship service, they really had an incredibly strong sense that God was calling them to adopt an unwanted child from China. And that they'd gone home and prayed about that and continued to pray about it. And it continued to be what they felt like was their plan for their life. They filled out all the paperwork, did everything necessary to begin this adoption process. And they waited. And they waited. And then they had their first child, their biological child, while they were waiting for this adoption. And they continued to wait, and they continued to wait, and after four or five years, they decided they would have a second biological child so that there wouldn't be this huge gap between their children. So they had a second biological child, and they waited, and they waited. And then finally, just a year ago, they got the word that they could travel to China and adopt this unwanted child. What a gift it was for them. How much they loved this child. They loved this child before he was even born. They want to lavish love on this child and on all three of their children. And yet, even as they love these three children, can they guarantee that nothing bad will ever happen to them? No, they can't. They can't guarantee that. What they can guarantee is that they will continue to love, that they will continue to comfort, that they will continue to support and to surround all three of their children with love and care. You know, just like Alexander was naive in thinking that if he moved to Australia, that no bad thing would ever happen again. It's erroneous for us, too, to think that because we are followers of Christ and that because God loves us and has a plan to offer grace to us through Jesus Christ, it's erroneous for us to think that nothing bad or terrible will ever happen to us. God does have a plan. God's plan is that God loved us before the foundation of the world. God's plan is to bless us with every good gift. God's plan is for us to be adopted in love through the grace of Jesus Christ. And God's plan is to support us and surround us and sustain us, and love us, and redeem us, even on the most terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Will you pray with me? Oh God, you are so good. You search and seek after us.
and have from before the foundation of the world. You are faithful and you forgive us even when we turn away from you, even when we are angry and choose death instead of life. Oh God, you are good and generous. You offer us every good gift and lavish grace on us. And oh God, you are purposeful and powerful and you have a plan for our lives that we will be adopted into your family as we come to know your love and your grace through Jesus Christ. So, oh God, we thank you. We claim that love, that redemption, that grace as we are welcomed into your family. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.